Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Varsity Tutor Star Course series, where today we're going to learn that anything you can do, you can do at a zoo. Our friends at the National Aviary are here today to teach us all about zoo careers and how animal lovers of all kinds can get involved and make a career at a zoo. We're joined today by Jen Torpy, Curator of Education and Public Programs at the National Aviary, and she's going to be giving us an inside look into the many different careers available at a zoo and we may even get to meet a new feathered friend along the way. Now, before I hand things off to Jen to get us started, I wanna make sure we can be as collaborative as possible today. So a few quick things to note. Throughout the lesson, Jen's gonna have some questions for you and we're guessing you'll have some questions for her as well. So feel free to put those questions and those answers in the chat box on the right-hand side of your screen. And if we don't get to those questions live, not to worry, we're gonna have about 10 minutes at the close of the lesson set aside for Q&A with Jen. You'll also wanna make sure that you have your cameras close by because toward the end of the lesson, we're gonna have the chance to lean into the screen and take a selfie with our new feathered friend. And if you tag National Aviary and Varsity Tutors on Instagram, you'll be entered to win a Wildlife Creature Camp subscription. Now I'll talk about a couple more of the details of that giveaway toward the end of the lesson. But in the meantime, I'm gonna go ahead and hand things off to your instructor for today, Jen. Take it away, Jen. Hi everyone. Thank you so much for having me today. My name is Jen. I'm a teacher here at the National Aviary. And the National Aviary is located in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Believe it or not, not Washington, DC. But we'd love for anyone to come visit us because we truly are National Aviary. We are home to more than 550 different animals from over 150 different species. Now, that's a lot of animals to take care for. And it takes a lot of people to make sure they are happy and comfortable. And today we're gonna to talk all about the different types of jobs you could do if you wanted to work in a zoo. Now, oftentimes we only think about people working in a zoo, working with animals, but I'm here to tell you today that you can do anything you wanna do in a zoo. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna brainstorm a little bit about what types of jobs you could do in a zoo. So it's time to type in the chat, what do you think you could do in a zoo? Type it in the chat. I'm sure we have lots of great guesses. Now, I see some really good guesses coming in already. First one, very good. A zookeeper is a good one. We also have veterinarian, nice. Cleaning, that's a good one. We need to make sure that everything is nice and clean. Some other ones working with people. Maybe you wanted to teach people about animals. Nice job, keep them coming. Wow, you guys already know a lot of different types of jobs you can do in a zoo. That's fantastic. Oh, yep, making food for the animals, perfect. All right, well, great job, everyone. These are some excellent suggestions. And given the many different types of jobs you have typed in, you already know you could do any job at a zoo. Now, when we look at this habitat, which is our wetlands habitat here at the National Aviary, you might just focus in on the flamingos and the beautiful ducks and Hadada ibis that are flying by. But what I see working here at the National Aviary is all of the work that goes into creating the habitat, keeping it nice and clean, making sure that our flamingo friend there has a healthy and nutritious diet, and that that flamingo has a really good healthcare plan. There's also people who work in habitats, not only to design them for the animals, but to make sure that people like you visiting the National Aviary can learn a little bit about them. So really, it's not just people who work with animals that are important to a zoo. So the zoo careers that you can have, like we've said, is pretty much anything you can imagine. If you want to do something, you could do it in the zoo. You could be a veterinarian or a veterinary technician. You could be a zookeeper. You could be an animal trainer. Maybe you're interested in working in nutrition and making food for animals. You could even work as a registrar if you really like paperwork. But there's other things you could do as well. You can work in conservation and education, maybe as a field researcher or as a teacher like me, or volunteering and coordinating volunteers. But that's just some of the things that you see as a visitor to the National Aviary or to any zoo. There's other jobs behind the scenes that are making everything run smoothly, without whom we couldn't run at all. 
There are exhibit designers who help make the habitats for animals. There are people who work in buildings and maintenance. If you really like to build things or you're into carpentry or you wanna be an electrician, there's a job for you at a zoo. If you are interested in making sure that everything is nice and clean and in tip top shape for visitors, maybe housekeeping is for you. And if you love plants, horticulture or landscaping is a great job that you can have in the zoo. And then there's things even more behind the scenes in operations. People working in visitor services. Who else are you gonna buy your ticket from when you come visit the National Aviary? You can maybe tell people about the National Aviary and work in marketing. Do you like to put together websites or go on social media? You might be a natural marketing expert. You can help raise money for the aviary and for zoos and work in philanthropy or fundraising. You can work in human resources, helping make sure the staff at the aviary have everything they need. Maybe you like to work in graphic design, or maybe you're a foodie and wanna work in the cafe services, or you love computers and wanna work in IT. Really anything you wanna do can help make a zoo function. Today, we're gonna to focus mostly on the animal related careers. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about some of those careers, what it is that they do here at the National Aviary, and how you'd get there if you wanted to do that job. In between each job, we are going to go behind the scenes and learn a little bit about what a day in the life is like with each of these jobs. And then at the end, we're going to meet my feathered friend. You might hear him talking a little bit during this presentation because he's very excited to meet you. So first, let's talk a little bit about veterinarians or veterinary technicians. Now, I want you to type in the chat, yes, or me, if you've ever thought about being a veterinarian. I'm curious how many people are aspiring to be a vet. I know from personal experience, I wanted to be a veterinarian for a really long time. And many of my friends did too. And I see many of you do as well. You've probably had really great experiences with veterinarians for your dogs or your cats or your snakes or your gerbils if you have exotic pets. Lots of aspiring veterinarians out there. Well, this first part of the presentation is for you then. So veterinarian's job is keeping animals healthy who live at the National Aviary. So what is it that they do every day? Well, they provide and oversee all of the different medical treatments that all of our animals need. So that could be things like giving vaccinations or doing annual checkups. Just like we go to the doctor every year to make sure that we're healthy, we need to do the same for our animals. Maybe an animal gets injured and they need emergency care. That's our veterinary team as well. They care for animals who need long-term care too. Animals who maybe live behind the scenes and need some medications multiple times a day. And they're always on call for emergencies. The veterinary team is the ones that you want in your corner, if something goes wrong. Now we're going to meet Gabby and Gabby is a technician, veterinary technician here at the aviary. And she's gonna show us a little bit about how she prepares medication for a pelican who was in the hospital just recently named Eloise. Hi everyone, this is Gabby, veterinary technician at the National Aviary and she is preparing Eloise the Pelican's antibiotic in her fish meal. Gabby, will you tell us a little bit about what you're doing? Absolutely, hello everyone. Um, so I'm gonna start loading up her fish because it is her favorite food. And we just take one little pill stick it right inside of the gills of the fish. So this hides it just enough that she doesn't know that it's in there, but she's getting all of her medicine. So I'm gonna carefully slide it in here. And then I'll use a nice Q-tip here to slip it through, just so it doesn't fall out. And it is nice and tight and secure inside of that fish, so she won't know that it's in there, but she'll get nice and better. And then you're gonna hand feed that to Eloise? Absolutely. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, I'm here with Eloise. We're gonna see if she's gonna take her medicated fish for us. If she does it this time, we're gonna just throw it again for her in a couple minutes. All right, Eloise, you ready? Here we go. All right, great job, Eloise. Thanks for taking your medicine. So she'll be starting to feel better in no time. So we got to see Gabby prepare medicine for a pelican. Now, you might not have thought about it, but getting a medicine into a pelican is pretty pretty challenging. You can't just offer them a pill. We need to think really creatively here at the National Aviary to make sure that all of our birds 
take their medicine. If you've had a dog or cat who maybe doesn't like to have their meds, you know how much of a struggle that can be. Uh, but that's where being creative and maybe inserting their medicine and hiding it into some fish is a really good way of making sure everyone gets everything they need to be healthy. Personally, I do not want vitamins or medicine in fish, but that's just me. So maybe you're wondering now, how can I do that? How can I become a veterinarian or a veterinary technician? Well, to become a veterinarian, you really wanna study science. Maybe if you were going to go to college, you wanna study pre-veterinary science or another science field. And then after that, you go to veterinary school, which is a four year degree. And then you would get your doctorate of veterinary medicine. After that, if you wanna work with exotic animals, you'd have to do a few internships at zoos as well. But maybe that sounds like a lot and you're not really interested in doing that. Maybe instead you wanna be a veterinary technician. Once you graduate high school, if you're still interested in that, you can go to a two year associate's degree to become a certified veterinary technician. What's the difference you ask? Well, the veterinarians are going to be the one who make diagnoses and write up a treatment plan, but the veterinary technicians are the ones who work with the animals most often. So if you wanna be hands-on with the animals, uh, the veterinary technician is the best one to go with. Now our veterinary technicians and our vet teams are super important to making sure that all of our animals are feeling well. But sometimes animals get really sick, whether they're here at the aviary or in their natural habitat. And luckily having a veterinary team like the ones we have here at the aviary can provide life-saving care like they did for Dottie the penguin. Let's learn her story. ago, Dottie developed a lung mass from pneumonia and she was in ICU. We gave her high level human grade antibiotics and nebulizations to help her heal. And the good news is we're thrilled to say that Dottie has made a full recovery. Dottie and Stan are very close, and when she became ill, she was missing him while she was in the hospital. So we brought Stan to live full-time in ICU with Dottie, and it immediately made her feel better. We are overjoyed today because the National Aviary staff spent the last seven months taking care of Dottie and nursing her back to health. And today is such a special day because we were able to see Dottie with Stan by her side back in Penguin Point. And I have to say, it, it made me tear up with happiness to see after all Dottie has been through that she is feeling great and she's back to her normal life in Penguin Point. Now that just goes to show you how important quality veterinary care can be to the animals at the National Aviary and really in zoos around the world. So if you're interested in working with animals as a veterinarian, you'd be a crucial member of the zoo team. But maybe working in medicine is not something that interests you. Maybe you're more interested in working with the animals every day and providing for an animal's daily needs or what we call their husbandry needs. Now, maybe you would wanna be a zookeeper Type in the chat, me or yes, if you wanna be a zookeeper. I'm curious how many aspiring zookeepers there are out there. In my experience, there's a lot. <laughs> oh, and I see they're already coming in. Me, hi, yeah, excellent, that's fantastic. Looks like uh, we're going to have lots of future zookeepers out there. Uh, we look forward to working with you in the future. So if you are a zookeeper, you're gonna to get to do lots of really cool things working with animals like this Southern bald ibis, maybe making sure that they have a delicious food or a proper habitat. You would be the one making sure that they have everything they need to live happy and healthy lives every day. 
Now that can be training uh, an, uh, an animal, which we'll talk about in a little bit. It can be making sure that they have a uh, clean habitat and they have everything they need to be happy. And it also means that you're going to work in close proximity with animals. But sometimes people want to become a zookeeper because they think they're going to get to touch the animals or hug animals. And even though we do love our animals here, usually as a zookeeper, you don't get to touch the animals. You want to make sure that you're treating them like your coworkers and your friends rather than like a pet. So we are going to learn a little bit about the daily job of a zookeeper from Danielle. Now, Danielle is a zookeeper. She's working in the tropical rainforest habitat right now. And there's a little bit of background noise and that's just because the water feature, that waterfall behind her is a little bit loud. And we're going to see what types of animals Danielle is working with in the tropical rainforest today. to see Danielle feeding lots of different types of animals here at the aviary and working at, as a zookeeper you need to know a lot about many different species or types of animals that can be where you're working. So that can be anything from the golden crested mina and the snowy egret to our Malayan flying fox bats which you can see one of our zookeepers working with here. So how is it that you would become a zookeeper and get all of that information? Well going to school and learning about biology and zoology or any related field like that. Anything where you can get lots of information about different types of animals is really, really helpful. But this is also a job that if you have enough experience and you start working right out of high school, you maybe don't need to go to college for. Um, but you wanna make sure that you have lots of animal experience. And the best way to do that is to start volunteering at your local zoo or your local wildlife rehab or animal care centers. 
Uh, you just need to make sure that you get as much information about animals as possible so that you can know what behaviors are normal, what they need to eat, and how to make their habitats best for them. And again, experience, experience, experience for any of these is important. So starting right now, getting a volunteer experience or learning about animals is the best way to make sure that you are gonna be a fantastic zookeeper. But what happens if you don't wanna just help create their habitats and maintain their habitats, but you wanna help, uh, help animals learn different behaviors? Well, that would be the job of an animal trainer. We've all probably done some animal training before, whether we knew it or not. Anytime we're interacting with an animal, we are helping them to learn how to communicate with us a little bit better. And animal trainers help animals to learn new behaviors that can help them participate in their own care. Now you may have done this with a dog, maybe even a cat, if you have a very willing to learn cat. Um, but as an animal trainer, you are training animals to do a variety of different things. In dogs, that might be to sit, stay, or maybe play fetch. But with animals at the National Aviary, it can be to come out and sit calmly on our arm while we're teaching a class. It can be helping them to go to certain places in their habitat or present their wings and open them so we can do a visual inspection for uh, their veterinary care. Anything that can help us uh, teach them how to participate in their own care. And oftentimes, animal trainers are also responsible for making sure that Animals are able to learn and display different behaviors, maybe even in a stage show. And they may work alongside of the animals to help teach people about these amazing creatures. But it's not just training behaviors, it's also making sure these animals have a wonderful life here at the aviary, providing enrichment, which is anything that stimulates an animal's senses or helps them engage with their environment, or creating safe habitats for animals. And they also are really important in facilitating education by highlighting an animal's natural behavior. So here at the aviary, that's what we do. When we're training our animals to do animal shows or come into classes, just like this one, we are helping to teach people about these amazing animals and making sure the animal's comfortable doing it is really the most important and best way to help make sure they have a good time and that we have a good time too. Now, in this next behind the scenes look, we're going to get to watch a few different training sessions and learn a little bit more about why we train animals here at the National Aviary. Hi guys, my name is Delaney. I'm one of the trainers here at the Aviary. And you guys are watching a training session with our Rose Eagle Owl, Zulu. Right now he is working on flying from those rocks to this tree and then flying back. Alright, and there you go. He did a great job. At the National Aviary, we love animals and go above and beyond to provide them with the highest level of care and individualized attention. One way that we can do that is through animal training or teaching animals how to respond to things we ask them to do. You may have even done this with your dog or a cat, teaching them to sit, stay, shake, or even roll over when given a special cue. Training helps our animals and our staff to form strong relationships that are built on trust. And it also creates shared systems of communication between our staff and the animals. And training is an exciting experience for our animals, one that they look forward to every day. But training is not just exciting, it also benefits our animals in many ways. By training animals to understand what we're asking them to do and to respond accordingly, animals become more comfortable with changes in their habitat. They can even actively participate in their daily care. Through training, we can teach our animals to voluntarily step onto a scale to be weighed, to stand still for veterinary examinations, and even to accept topical medications that they need to stay healthy. Here you can see one of our staff members is working with our silver gulls. The silver gulls are voluntarily accepting lotion being spread on their foot 
This will help prevent dry skin and is important to keeping our birds comfortable. So training animals can help them engage with their environment, be comfortable as changes are happening around them, to participate in bird shows like the one shown here, or to accept medications in a way that is comfortable for them. Now that's super important and helps to build really strong relationships between our staff and our animals. And we're really proud of the animal training program that we have here at the National Aviary. Now, if you wanted to be an animal trainer, how on earth would you get there? Well, uh, there's a few different things that you can learn about to become a really great animal trainer. First, you can maybe go to college to study psychology, biology, or zoology. Anything that teaches you how animals think and how to interact with and understand animals exhibiting different behaviors. You need to make sure you have a strong understanding of training techniques. Do you have a dog or a cat at home? Maybe a snake, maybe a turtle, maybe even a hamster. You can train any animal. Now, if you wanted to really start, you'd learn the different behaviors of your animal and then learn a lot about training and try it out with the animals at home. You might be surprised what you learned about communicating with animals while you're doing the training process. And then you also wanna make sure that you're a creative problem solver, able to think things through from an animal's perspective. And again, experience, experience, experience. It's super important to helping you learn how animals are trying to communicate with you and may understand how you are communicating with them. Now, I wanna share with you one video of one of the coolest behaviors I think we have of any animal here at the National Aviary. And that is of our sloth Valentino, who recently learned how to paint for an animal encounter. Let's take a look at how they did that. In a new sloth painting encounter, participants will have the opportunity to watch our resident artist and sloth ambassador, Valentino, engage his senses by creating a one-of-kind masterpiece for each participant to take home. Here, our education trainers, Krista and Mike, are training Valentino to paint in preparation for this exciting experience. Valentino first starts by getting comfortable with the brush and canvas and learns that when he touches the brush to the canvas, he gets one of his favorite treats, sweet potato. Painting is a fun way to engage Valentino's mind and his senses, keeping him engaged in his environment. Now that he's got the hang of it, it's time to introduce the paint. During the sloth painting encounter, guests will be able to choose their own paint colors, but Valentino can get creative with the brush strokes. So what Valentino does with that paint is completely up to him. We hope that watching our sloths paint and learning a little bit about them will inspire your creativity. And we hope that you'll come visit the National Aviary and visit Wookie, Valentino, and Vivian for yourself real soon. I think that was probably better than I could even paint. Valentino did a great job on that painting. And it takes a lot of one-on-one -on -one work to train an animal to do something like that. So we have a great program here at the Aviary and if you're ever in Pittsburgh, I invite you to come take a look. Now, we also have some other opportunities if you are interested in working with animals. Maybe you're really interested in food and learning about how animals eat and how they stay healthy. Well, the commissary specialist or nutritionist provides a healthy and balanced diet for all of the animals at the National Aviary. Now, they are responsible for preparing diets for animals, making sure that we have enough food here at the aviary to feed 550 animals every day, researching the needs of our different animals. Every individual has their own preference and every species needs different types of food. So we need to know what that is to make sure they have a healthy, balanced diet. They also make sure that we have good sanitation, not cross-contaminating anything, 
and they also handle our dishes and making sure everything is nice and clean. And additionally, they provide food enrichment, making sure our animals are foraging and thinking through some food puzzles to get their food. Now let's meet Anna, our commissary specialist here at the National Aviary, and she'll walk us through some of the types of food that we feed our birds here every day. Hi everyone, my name is Anna. I'm one of the senior aviculturists here at the National Aviary. I'm going to be telling you a little bit about uh, all of our food prep, um, how we make our meals for our birds, and give you a little tour of our commissary today. Uh, so this is one of our main food prep areas. We have some fruit mix over here, um, which is kind of nice little bite-sized pieces for a lot of our birds. Um, we also have various pellets and seeds. Um, all of our birds have very specialized diets, specialized nutritional needs. So we want to make sure that we're meeting that as much as we can here uh, and formulating the diets uh, to meet those needs. Um, we also have lots of fresh fruits and vegetables. We do. Um, we actually get our produce from the same place that restaurant supply companies get theirs. So the same food that you would eat at home, our birds are going to eat here. Um, so and things like uh, watermelon, we have corn on the cob, we've got carrots, we have kale, all kinds of things for them. Um, certain things are coming into season right now. So like I said, corn on the cob, watermelon, strawberries, all those yummy stuff um, our birds are very much enjoying right now. Um, we have different uh, pellets. We've got some little finch seed for our little guys. We've got some pigeon seed for some of our bigger uh, bigger birds. Um, we've got parrot pellet, um, all kinds of different fruit pellets. Um, we also have our diet sheets. So this is what I follow, just the same way that you would follow a recipe if you were making food at home. We have recipes for all of our birds as well, for all of our uh, meals. So we have everything written out exactly. That way, whoever is making the diets knows exactly what to make. Um, so things are nice and consistent and our birds get exactly what they're supposed to be getting every single day. Um, so if you like to make recipes or follow recipes or work with food, being a commissary specialist or a nutritionist at a zoo is a really rewarding job. You get to make sure that everything our animals are eating is the best it possibly can be. So how on earth can you do that? Well, it really depends on the zoo you're going to work in. There's not really a commissary specialist degree that you can get. But again, uh, learning a lot about different types of animals, having a background in zookeeping, biology, zoology, or nutrition, maybe even veterinary medicine is going to be really, really helpful for you. Now, the last career we're going to talk about is conservation scientist. This is a very exciting one. Conservation scientists work at zoos, they work out in the field. They work for many different organizations helping to study animal behavior and help save and conserve species around the world. So what exactly would they do? Well, they would conduct field research, study animal behavior, maybe write research grants and publish their research. If you're really, really curious about animals and how they live out in their habitats, this is a really great job for you because not only would you be able to research and answer questions you have about animals, but you can tell other people and share that information with other scientists. How would you get there though? Well, you can have an undergraduate degree and experience in biology, zoology, or something related. Usually conservation scientists end up going to graduate school and getting a graduate degree in whatever they're interested in. Here at the National Aviary, we have two ornithologists, um, one who has his doctorate and one who has his master's that do research on birds. And you can have research experience. Maybe this is something where you volunteer in middle school or high school for a project, or you do research in your undergraduate or graduate work. Any way you can get experience out in the field is gonna be helpful. And the great thing about this is that a conservation scientist can work in a zoo, in the field, or both. And all of that work is going to uh, help us learn about animals and learn how we can best help them. Like the very special bird, the Mariana fruit dove. In this final behind the scenes video, we are going to learn a little bit about the Mariana fruit dove, how it became so endangered, and how the National Aviary's conservation scientists, zookeepers, and all of our staff here are working to help. The Mariana fruit dove is a beautiful bird native to the Pacific Islands. This species is found in a variety of types of forested habitat, but they prefer mature native forests where they typically feed on fruits in the canopy. 
Sometimes, however, they may descend to feed in bushes or even on the ground. They're a fairly secretive species, rarely spotted and nearly always solitary. This species is listed as endangered by the IUCN and has seen steep population declines over the last century. Habitat loss has played a factor in these declines, but more significant has been the devastating effects of the invasive brown tree snake in their habitat. The Mariana fruit dove is native to the island of Guam and the nearby Mariana Islands. In 1920, Guam was an island that was home to more than 120 different forest bird species, 12 of which were endemic to the island. But during World War II, the United States gained control of Guam and built military defenses against Japan. By 1950, it became apparent that the brown tree snake, a venomous snake native to Papua New Guinea, had smuggled its way onto the island, likely on ships providing military provisions. With no natural predators on the island and a veritable bird buffet, the brown tree snake population boomed while island birds declined. Nine of the 12 endemic species are now extinct in the wild, including the Guam kingfisher. And many, like the Mariana fruit dove, have been extirpated or completely removed from the island. The National Aviary has worked tirelessly with field conservation partners and partners in other AZA accredited institutions to help save this and other endangered species. The National Aviary's experts work in a state-of-the-art breeding center to create the perfect conditions to encourage these precious birds to lay eggs and raise healthy chicks, contributing to the survival of their population and human care. And in 2020, the National Aviary welcomed its first Mariana fruit dove fledgling. makes this important conservation work possible. So thank you for supporting the National Aviary, participating in animal encounters, education programs, and by donating, you have helped create conservation efforts that are making a difference for birds around the world. Hopefully, you'll be able to visit the National Aviary one day soon and see the Mariana fruit dove and its wonderful dove cousins for yourself. We've got to learn about a lot of different types of careers that you can have at the National Aviary and about other at other zoos. Now, I'm happy to introduce you to my friend Dumbledore. And Dumbledore is a fantastic, uh, fantastic animal ambassador here at the Aviary who gets to come out, meet people like you, and teach a little bit about owls and about the National Aviary. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about our friend Dumbledore, and then I'm happy to uh, take any of your questions. Dumbledore here uh, is a Eurasian eagle owl. This is one of the largest species of owls in the entire world. They are native to Russia, Europe, and even a little bit in Northern Africa. If he were to open his wings, he would be have a wingspan of about four and a half to five feet. And he is very vocal. He's been very excited to come out and meet you. I bet you didn't expect an owl to make a sound like this. Usually we think about them just going, not, ah, ah. <laughs> but owls have many different types of sounds that they can make to communicate. And he is telling me he is happy to be here. And he's excited for a little piece of meat that I have in my pouch here. Dumbledore was not hatched here at the National Aviary but he came to us when he was very young and he is about 14 or 15 years old now. Now that might seem like he's old for a bird, but in fact, he is pretty young. This species can comfortably live to be in their forties, <laughs> maybe even 50 years old. So Dumbledore will be an ambassador here at the National Aviary for a long time. All right, well, I have a delicious piece of food that I'm going to feed him. And when I'm feeding him, you'll notice he's leaning forward and taking it with his beak, which is a very great characteristic of owls, that tearing beak that they have. It's one of the many adaptations that make owls so good at hunting. <laughs> now, I'm sure you have many questions about Dumbledore and about working in a zoo, and I'm excited to take your questions. 
All right. So before we get to those questions, I do want to give students an opportunity to lean into the screen with <laughs> Jen and Dumbledore for that uh, for that selfie opportunity. So go ahead, Dumbledore, Jen, take it away. <laughs> I think that uh, Dumbledore is very excited to be here as he's up close. As you're getting your selfie, you can notice a few really cool features that Dumbledore has. He's showing you his <laughs> big eyes. Eyes of an owl are so big that if your eyes were the size of an owl in relation to your body size, each of your eyes would be the size of a softball. Can you imagine how big that would be <laughs> in your head? You also get to see the long feathers on top of his head. They look a little bit like the ears of a dog. Um, those are called feather tufts and help them to camouflage. It doesn't have anything to do with hearing. Their ears are on the side of their head, just like ours. <laughs> Nice job, Dumbledore. I bet your selfies came out really good, everybody. He's a very, very handsome bird and he knows it. <laughs> All right, awesome. Thank you so much, Jen. Thank you so much, Dumbledore. And as a quick reminder, everybody, if you post those selfies on Instagram and you tag us, as well as the National Aviary, you'll have the opportunity to win that Wildlife Creature Camp subscription. And in this one week camp, students have the opportunity to learn about all sorts of wildlife with their fellow explorers. So from the winged and wonderful to the scaly and maybe sometimes <laughs> scary, they'll also get the chance to complete unplugged and after camp challenges and receive specialized content from our camp guest stars. Now with that, uh, it looks like we're ready for a couple of questions. Will Dumbledore be hanging out with us for those questions? Absolutely. He's excited to hear <laughs> about the questions too. Very cool. I'm glad we uh, I'm glad we clarified some of that uh, kind of special guest background noise we were hearing earlier in the class because we had quite a few students who were very convinced you had a literal elephant in the room. <laughs> he, definitely, he definitely can make quite a big sound. I bet you didn't imagine that sound was coming from this owl. He's a big owl, but he's not as big as an elephant, but he can certainly call really, really loud. And that's because they can help defend yeah. their territories if they can call uh, pretty loudly. So he's also telling me he's a little hungry. So he's going to get some more meat when he goes back to his home. Oh, that is so cool. <laughs> now, we had, uh, we had some students who caught a glimpse of Valentino and some of your other not so feathered friends. Mm -hmm. uh, so they were wondering how many types of animals and how many animals do you care for at the National Aviary? Yeah. Great question. So at the National Aviary, we're home to more than 550 individual animals from over 150 different species. Aviary just means that we're a bird zoo, but just like you noticed, we have some mammals here as well. We have three Linnaeus two-toed slots, Loki, <laughs> Vivian, and Valentino. We have four Malayan flying fox bats, and we even have a few armadillos. And you might be wondering, why does an aviary, home to so many birds, have any mammals at all? Well, it helps us talk about biodiversity. Birds aren't the only animals that are going <laughs> to live in their habitats. They're not even the only animals that can fly. So it helps us to talk a little bit about different adaptations to flight and how important every single animal is to the survival of their ecosystems. That is so cool. And it brings us to our next question. Students also notice, they seem to have a very keen eye on some of the details of our videos. Uh, also notice that you had several different birds or different species in perhaps the same habitat. So talk to me a little bit there. Can they safely live among one another in those habitats? Are there certain animals that you have to keep separate? Yeah, great question. They absolutely can, depending on the species, right? We want to make sure that we're not going to put a bald <laughs> eagle that likes to eat meat or an owl that likes to eat meat with an animal that might be a prey item. So we're not going to mix any birds that might want to eat each other. But most of the time, birds can live really, really comfortable all together. And if you think <laughs> about it, that makes a lot of sense, right? If we look in our backyards, there's many different species or kinds of birds that live together in the same habitat. And that's the same in habitats all around the world. So we make sure that in our habitat rooms, all of our birds have the types of foods that they need. They're not gonna compete for each other uh, for different nesting material or foods and that everyone is getting along. So it is definitely possible, but we will make sure that we're not going to stress anyone out by putting them in a situation where they might get uh, concerned at their lunch. So that's not gonna happen. Most of the birds uh, or all the birds in the habitats are very, very comfortable with each other. Yeah, it looks like it. And it sounds like there's a 
pull a lot of application for that research so that we know what types of animals will get along with one another. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and it's the job of everyone at the aviary. We're always watching animal behavior and making sure we know how comfortable they are with <laughs> others uh, and how they're engaging in their habitat. So if you're interested in that type of work, um, we are happy to have you. The zoo, uh, the zoo world is ready for you to your, have your own zoo career. That is so awesome. And this, this next question may be a tricky one to answer, especially with Dumbledore right there with you, but uh, lots of students are wondering if you have a favorite animal <laughs> and Ooh. if you want to talk a little bit about that favorite animal. Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, and honestly, I think everyone here at the aviary would say it's whatever bird we're working with at that moment, right? We don't want to make Dumbledore offended. <laughs> but Dumbledore and uh, his daughter, Pumpkin, are actually two of my favorite birds to work with. And I'm not just saying that, Dumbledore. Uh, I also really enjoy working with um, some of the parrots that we have as our animal ambassadors. But I really love just walking through our habitats. Every time I walk through our immersive habitats and see any of the birds here at the aviary, I learn something new about them. So I'm always learning about them as individuals, as species, and my appreciation for them just grows every time I interact with the birds. So uh, it's, it's really hard to say, but we'll just make Dumbledore feel better and say, for right now, it's Dumbledore. Oh, that is so great. And it looks like it looks like Dumbledore has got a pretty good read on where you've got that meat stash. He does, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Aw, uh, well, it is about that time, but I would love to hear from you and students would love to hear from you on uh, just any final thoughts. I know you've given us so much around uh, what people who are interested in careers with animals and careers at a zoo might be able to do. Uh, maybe a little bit more on final <laughs> thoughts for perhaps some of our younger viewers who aren't thinking about what degrees they want to get just yet, but would still love to know how they can start to get involved. Absolutely. So the best thing I can say, and if you take away anything from this presentation, it's that anything you're interested in, whether it's science, art, music, there is something for you to do in a zoo. And the best thing you can do right now is just to learn everything you can about anything you're interested in. So pursue your passions, learn about animals and the environment and tell other people about it. Help share your passion with others. And uh, whether you work in a zoo or not, you'll become a great steward of our environment. That is so awesome. Well, thank you so much, Jen. Thank you so much, Dumbledore, for being such a fantastic guest with us today. That is all the time that we have, but just another great big thank you to the National Aviary for joining us. And Thanks to all of you who tuned in and asked such wonderful questions. Now, the National Aviary is going to be back with us on July 6th. But in the meantime, we hope to see everybody back in another Varsity Tutors Star Course soon. And don't forget to post those selfies and tag Varsity Tutors and the National Aviary to win. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much for having us.